Hello and welcome back to another edition of Colored Conversations. We have took some time off, probably about a year, but we are back in Colored Conversations, you know, a safe space to talk about race and also just to raise the level of consciousness for Black people, white people, just raise the level of consciousness to what's really going on in the world today. But we have a special guest for this episode, but we have some, some news about um, our guest later on. But we want to open up with a word of prayer, and then I'll go ahead and introduce my guest one more time. So let's go ahead and pray. Bow with me. Uh, Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, please forgive us for our sins. We just ask that you will have their way in this um in this conversation today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, again, everybody, welcome back to another edition of Cover the Conversations. We took some time off, but we are back, and we're going to try to do this every other week. You know, that'll be the cadence, you know, at the same time at 12 o'clock. But we have a special guest with us today, you know, Dr. Trevor Kinlock. Come on, I'm going to show him some love. Show him some love. All right. Now, that Dr. Trevor Kinlock, and I just, I just tell some about you. Dr. Trevor Kinlock, uh, he is a professor of sociology at Howard University. But of course, he has a pastor. So he's a pastor of the Hyattsville. Uh, of sorry, of the Metropolitan Seventh Day Adventist Church in Hyattsville, Maryland. As you all know, I'm Pastor Keenan Tyler. I passed the Cedars of Lebanon and Coastal Shores Seventh Day Adventist Churches in Chesapeake and Virginia Beach. And we're just delighted to have you today, my brother. So, so God bless you. Want to introduce or tell, did I say it all? Want to say anything? Yeah, about yeah, yeah, yeah. You said you said too much, man. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Good afternoon, my brother. Good to see you again. How are you? Good, good, good. I, I, I'm feeling your shirt, man. Black okay, joy. Yeah, joy, man. Yeah, Black joy, man. Yeah, Black joy, man. Yeah, real I'm nice. I'm feeling your shirt too, man. Definitely got to represent where we come from, man. Got to represent HBCU, represent HU, uh, represent Oakwood, I should say. Um, I get my Howard shirt next time I'm on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But, but good to be with you, man. It's been, um, what, a little over a year, I think, since we, we did this the last time. And mm -hmm. a whole lot has taken place. Um, in that time. So it's good to be back with you, my brother, and um, excited for what we're going to talk about today. All right, cool. Great. Great, man. So what's so interesting, last year when we met, January 6, 2021, while we were discussing and talking, at the very same time, there was an insurrection taking place at the Capitol building. At the very same time. So now we have almost a year and what? Just about a month almost after almost 13 months later. And so let's jump right into that, to it. What do you think about the insurrection, you know, and where we at right now? What are your thoughts? Yeah, you, you know, it, it was something, uh, Preacher, when we were, when we had our last color conversations together, it was a little over a year ago, it was January 6th. And um, I remember one of the questions came in um, from, from one of the viewers, just real concerned about what they were seeing in the country and wondering what, what was happening, what was taking place. And they asked, is this civil war? Um, are we about to go into civil war? And this is before everything really broke out um, that, that day. And I remember, um, answering that person that we were not, I did not feel based on what we were seeing right now that we were about to go into civil war at that um, particular moment, historical moment. Um, however, I, I was very clear about where the sentiments of certain people are and groups are in this country, the racial anxieties, and it is very clear where that is, where that is headed. So when we look now at January 6th in the rear view, I think what it is important for us to remember and never forget is that this is just yet another um, occurrence, another reminder that violence is part and parcel of the um, instruments of choice being used by those in power in this country. Um, it is the instrument of choice of white supremacy and has been so for the last 400 years um, of our time on these shores to ensure um, racial hierarchy. Um, we have seen that in all kinds of ways and January 6th was yet another um, reminder that um, certain folk with they do not feel like they have the ability to to win or, or things don't go their way uh, politically, they are willing to take up arms um, and to take action and actually to invade their own capital and their own um, building. The images that we saw on that day that were broadcast all around the world, remember one of our boys, um, 
texted me that day and I said, don't forget this um, because you're going to see this again. This is a, um, an example of the violence um, that is the tool um, that has been used by white supremacy and those who want to maintain um, racial order and racial hierarchy in this country. Um, matter of fact, I mean, I, we were just talking just, um, just a few moments ago about um, I'm at Howard and um, for the last two days in a row, we have gotten bomb threats um, at the university. And of course, those who uh, have caught the news have seen at least 12 other HBCUs also received similar bomb threats that really disrupted things. It was disruptive at Howard. Um, the students had to go into a shutdown, a shelter in place. Um, when I got on campus, they had given the all clear, um, but I just had a chance to talk to my students and just find out, you know, do a check in. How are you all doing? And um, to hear the concern to hear uh, the concern for their safety, their well-being, their emotional health. Um, there is an impact um, with with these types of actions, and um, my students felt that. I, I took the time as a professor to try to um, encourage them in the midst of it, and I said, "Listen, um, you all remember this one thing: no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper." And uh, just you know, we we had church for a quick second, but just a quick second, and then went back into the lecture. Um, but these are examples; these are common, uh, reoccurring examples of the use of violence. So whether it is HBCU bomb threats, uh, whether it is the Nazis in Charlottesville, whether it is Dylan Roof, whether um, it is uh, what we saw on January six, um, we need to understand the moment that we're in, and that there are true anxieties about the. Um, economic and political direction um, of where this country is going. And that conversation and that dynamic is always tied to race. It has always been tied to race. And we do a disservice to try to see it through some other prism. Um, this is a concern about ensuring that uh, some folk remain in their place while others um, remain in uh, positions of power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that, um, that you just said that stood out to me is Charlottesville. You know, some people say that Charlottesville, like that set the tone of, I don't want to say the, yeah, the presidency of, of Donald Trump. Seven months into his presidency, the whole incident, you know, have a, have a hire, you know, she mm -hmm. she died there. She yeah. was, you know, hit by a car. The guy, James, he's serving life in prison. Um, but um, in the, the first interview, I think Donald Trump, he said they are good people mm -hmm. on both sides. Both sides. And some people believe like that set the tone mm -hmm. for his presidency and it emboldened and empowered yeah. these yeah. white supremacist groups just to just to rise yeah. up uh, even more. And like that right there, what happened at Charlottesville, that was the warm-up to the Capitol building. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so will you agree? What, what do you think? About yeah, it? yeah, definitely. It, it was uh, what we saw with the last president was a legitimizing of these very hard handed, uh, violent tactics and approaches, this kind of mob rule, mob mentality. Um, what we saw in his presidency, honestly, was, was the return of, of fascism or neo fascism. Uh, he's a neo fascist. Um, and all of the signals that he gave to his supporters um, literally um, ginned them up um, to actually on, on January 6th. Um, ended up to invade their, it motivated them to invade their own capital and um, the images that we saw um, on the television a little over a year ago. Um, but that type of um, uh, ideological um, mindset um, is dangerous, um, but that is what is present in kind of the American consciousness and always has been. But anytime that you see the anxieties of different groups, um, violence is sure to follow. And that's kind of the, the era that we are in. And a lot of folks thought that this would end with, uh, with uh, the end of Trump's presidency. Um, but again, we still see um, the same dynamics. We still see a very strident, angry, um, uh, far right uh, fringe, if you want to call it that. Um, I probably won't even call it fringe because they, they have been embraced by a good um, good plurality or majority of, um, of, of the right, um, but, but they are okay and they have demonstrated uh, tolerance for these type of, uh, this type of violence, the violence that we have seen over the last several years. And that can only lead to um, um, even worse actions. So if Charlottesville was the warm up to January 6th, what is January 6th the warm up to? Hmm. That's a good question. 
And we saw the same thing in the Civil War um, as well. Before the actual Civil War uh, broke out, you saw these kind of intermittent skirmishes, these smaller flare ups that happened just before it that were kind of um, the, the Southern Confederacy kind of, or uh, Southerners given their indication that they were, they were done and they were ready to take up arms um, to, defend, uh, to defend slavery. Mm-hmm. Well, only, only because you, you went there, um, you know, just doing my, doing my research, just talking about the Civil War. We're going back to voter. Um, we're going to go back to January sixth. Yeah. But, but just doing my research, I learned that only one percent of the Southerners had actual plantations, like mm-hmm. large plantations. Absolutely. But the majority of those in the South, um, you know, they either um, didn't have slaves, or they had like ten to 15 slaves, like really small right. amounts of slaves. But this 1%, they, they felt threatened because, again, losing their power, you know, if slavery, if the slaves are set free, then therefore they will lose power. Mm. Oh, that's something right there. But if they if they lose this power, you know, so they felt threatened. So because they felt threatened, they almost, they they, they looked at the other other slave owners, those who had 10 or 15, and then the ones who could not afford no slaves at all, other mm-hmm. white people, some of us who could not afford no slaves at all. And the an impression that they gave to him was, look, one day you could be like me. Mm-hmm. So, so, so look, you need to help, even though you don't own a slave, you can't afford to have a slave, but one day you may be able to do that. So you need to come on, uh, take up arms, and let's fight. Let's fight this battle against the North. And I and I see that same type of spirit. Mm-hmm. You know this quote unquote one percent. Uh, Donald yeah. Trump said, "Look, one day, look, look, they can't be like us because mm-hmm. they're black, they're of color. But you too, even though you don't have no money, but you could be like me one day. So come on and let's fight this and take mm-hmm. quote." Unquote, make America great again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, listen, preacher, I think the, the fallacy, and you, you just broke down what the facts are, the fallacy folks think that, you know, all white Southerners back in the day were slave owners. And mm-hmm. that's just, just patently false. That's that's not true. Um, as you just identified, the minority of whites in the South were, um, were slave owners. And the even smaller uh, minority were large plantation or, or slave owners. Um, so you're talking about a good amount of whites in the South who did not own slaves, were not slave owners, did not have massive plantations, but they were actually poor. Mm-hmm. Their class status, they identify uh, on, on the lower end of the socioeconomic hierarchy. Um, they were poor whites and, and their lives were, were, if you were to compare them to some of the slaves um, of, of that time, their lives were perhaps marginally better, um, at least with regard to some of the political rights that they may have had. But economically, they were almost at the same station or the same uh, class as, as slaves. Um, however, um, in um, there's, there's a book called The Wages of Whiteness, where they talk about the psychological benefits of, of whiteness. Um, mm-hmm. And that is um, feeling that even though I might not be the richest white uh, mm-hmm. person, at least I'm not black. <laughs> at least I'm not that black dude. At right. least I'm not a slave. At least I'm not the N word. At least I'm not that. And so mm-hmm. even um, even at the even if I had more economically um, and the way my life was structured, I had more in common with black folk. Just the fact that I'm not black gave me a sense of superior su- superiority. And that dynamic has allowed um, the upper, the ruling class um, uh, of, 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 in that time, white slave owners, that has allowed them to drive the narrative and to run society in a way that not only dominates or dominated black slaves, but also dominated the poor whites of that time. And we see those same dynamics that, are ha- that have happened historically, and those same dynamics continue to take place today. Those who have been sort of the most adamant, uh, make America great again, you know, they're uh, recipients of Obamacare, you know, their children were brought back from the Iraq war, um, they, um, ex- uh, they received stimulus, uh, and, and so many other things um, they, they were able to benefit from. However, they do not, they're unable to see their um, economic similarities with other class, with other groups or racial groups, they mm-hmm. will rather um, partner 
with the ruling class or the, the richer, the upper classes, um, even though they don't have much in common with them outside of their skin color. Hmm. Now, can you just imagine if they was like, hold on, wait, I'm, why am I fighting? I'm poor too. Mm -hmm. You poor, I'm poor. What are we banded together? Yeah. You yeah, Dr. King uh, brought that out as well during the time of civil rights uh, when um, he and others were um, were locked up in, in jail when they were arrested. Uh, they would talk to the jailers and they said, wait a second, you all should be marching with us. And mm -hmm. they would have these real intellectual conversations with the white jailers to let them know um, we're fighting for some of the same things to help improve your life. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's it's been hard. Um, W.B. Du Bois in Black Reconstruction, he talks about this same dynamic as well. Uh, yeah. Uh, the white working class being unable to um, organize across class and kind of have a class analysis and economic analysis of their situation and partner with other oppressed classes so that they can improve their social situation. They have been unable to do that because of the dynamic of race. Um, the division that race causes, causes them to see, to prefer racial solidarity over um, economic and social solidarity. Mm. Wow, yeah. Yeah, the, the same scale, dynamic today. Yeah, the scales got to come off. The scales yeah. got to come off. I think yeah. only only Jesus can do that, really. Mm. You know, Lord yeah. help us. And if anybody, if you're listening, you got any questions, go ahead, post post in the chat. You're watching on YouTube or Facebook, you go ahead and post the question. Um, all right, so voter 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 suppression that was the next thing. You know, mm -hmm. was there anything else you want to say about January 6th? I know you said that if 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 the insurrection, or rather, if Charlottesville was the was the warm up mm -hmm. for for January six, what is January six the warm up? Yeah, yeah, to, yeah. You know? there, there's an absolute escalation, and our society mm -hmm. is um, these elements, these dynamics are still here, and they have only kind of gotten more more feverish. Um, you have those who insist that the uh, current president was not duly elected, um, yeah. and these are elected representatives. Um, mm -hmm. These are our politicians that. Um, um, oversee or, or preside over political constituencies of people that are uh, pushing this narrative. They're talk show hosts and media um, platforms that, that are pushing this as well. So this is not, January 6th was not the end of something. Um, it certainly was a very clear, if anything, it clearly underscored where we're headed. Right, right. And speak, speaking of that, just, just came to my mind, you know, I don't know if, if it'll look like what it looked like with the Capitol building on January 6th. And of course, they beefed up security. It may look a little different, mm -hmm. but I know what though. At these school board meetings throughout the country, you you get a little sense of that. You know where they they're not as heavily um you know they don't have as much security, but you get that same sense in these school board meetings talking about uh, critical race theory and and and, and all these different mm -hmm. things. That the oh yeah. Oh you yeah. Get the same, you oh, get yeah. that same sense. Absolutely. Um, do, you, do you see that as well? Yeah, I was just just reading an article um two days ago um where um you know uh, ultra conservative leaders were um insisting and they they just got in trouble for it but they said when you go to the polls make sure you go armed. Yeah. Make sure bring your weapons to the polls. Mm -hmm. Um and, and of course that that dovetails right into this whole idea of voter intimidation um which is the which is the place that we are right now when we talk about voter right. suppression. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, I, and I, I hope those who are, are kind of paying attention to, to what we're seeing right now, understand that these are not um, just coming out of nowhere. These, these, these new uh, dynamics within society didn't just arrive today, but they are part of a, a long fabric, a, a broader um, uh, historical line that goes back hundreds of years. And we just kind of see these things coming up over and over again in different ways. Um, voter suppression is is as old as, as white power um, mm -hmm. and the ability to, to maintain and protect that. And what we see again, not only just in the civil rights movement, but now what we see again today um, is an effort to disenfranchise, disenfranchise um, those voters that um, are of a different political um, and, and frankly racial um, group to to take away their power or their ability um, to um, to have agency to impact their world and impact what the country looks like, what their states look like, um, their cities, and and just all the way down. So the, these new laws, if you look at them, um, they they border on the ludicrous, um, except they have specific intent. Um, you cannot. It's a um, 
uh, a misdemeanor or felony um, to pass out water to um, those who are waiting to who are yeah. in line waiting to vote. And of course, we know those who are waiting in line to vote are predominantly in um, districts that are filled with people of color. Um, other districts don't have, the, uh, because there are so few polling places, uh, polling stations in many of our communities. So we know who um, this was meant to impact. Um, the closing of even more precincts, the uh, whole wave of laws were passed over the last year, um, all throughout this country in multiple states all around, not just in the South, but all around the country um, to close precincts, to cut down on Sunday voting, understanding that a large part of the black constituency um, goes to vote after church service, after Sunday church service. Um, and so if Jim Crow was um, the effort to, and the successful effort to disenfranchise um, blacks who had just gotten the right to vote after the Civil War and, and because of uh, Reconstruction afforded them now um, social and political rights, um, the end of Reconstruction um, led to the rise of Jim Crow and the taking away of those rights. Uh, mm -hmm. What we saw from um, 1877 all the way to the Civil Rights Act of 1965 was a um, was a disenfranchising and a taking away of the power of uh, Black people in the South. What we see today is a continuing um, a continuing of that same dynamic um, and Stacey Abrams, she called it surgical racism, yeah. where the laws were constructed in a way that they're so precise to ensure um, that certain group, they will impact uh, certain people. So there's certainly a racial intent that is there behind the law. But of course, you got to litigate that um, at the highest levels to, to try to prove it and try to demonstrate it. So this is the new fight. This is where we are. The new fight is connected to the old fight, is connected to the older fight. Um, there's an unbroken line of struggle um, of social struggle that we have faced in this country and certainly that we face globally and face in the world. Um, but it is uh, dealing with the system of white supremacy and um, the, the, uh, the, ra the racialization, the, 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 hierarch the hierarchicalizing of, um, of, of different racial groups, putting some on top and others on the bottom and keeping them there by taking away their rights, their political rights to be able to change their situation. Right. That thirst for power at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. thirst, thirst for power. Yeah. You know, the thirst for power, the thirst to maintain power. Um, you know, we saw this voter surge um, in the pandemic. If yeah. you, you think about what the last um, presidential election was, um, mm -hmm. record turnout um, all around. Um, and, and certainly black turnout was was supercharged as a result of uh, the racial reckoning and the George Floyd protests and everything else supercharged black folk went to the polls and that 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 was a wave that swept um, across the country and had political implications um, there are those who are um, very displeased with that dynamic and don't want that to happen again anytime that that wave included um, the state of Georgia um, a, a traditionally more conservative state a red state um, uh, politically or, or if we look at uh, Democrat, Republican, um, they ended up electing two, um, two Democratic senators um, and sending them to the U.S. Senate, giving the Democrats um, an edge um, in, in the Senate. There are so many um, within, um, within the South that are not pleased with that and within mm -hmm. this country that are not pleased with that. And so these efforts are intentional, they're surgical, they're precise, and they are looking to make sure that what happened um, in the last election cannot happen again because we will just keep people from voting. Yeah, yeah. If your if your vote did not matter, there would not be this um, this sustained, right. intentional, well financed effort to try to take it away and keep you um, and our communities from from voting. Your voting matters. It's all right. So that's what, what I was going to ask you: is that so? So many people say, "Well, my vote it doesn't matter." Then why 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 are they going through all this to say? Yeah, I get it. I get it. And they, they say that out of the frustration with the political process, that it can be slow, that you just don't in one election put somebody in and then they they change poverty. They change, you know, yeah, it's uh, like, they, like they get rid of they, racism. They they get rid of, yeah. Right, right. So so they, they're looking for tangible change. And, and we have seen, you know, um, our people and our communities have suffered under Democrats. They suffered under Republicans. So um, black oppression is bipartisan. Um, in this country, in the United States, and hold on, you got to say that again. 
Yeah, I said black, black oppression, oppression is, is, is bipartisan. So it's not just Republicans? Yeah. Not just Democrats? <laughs> Listen, if you look at the Democratic Party of the uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s, though, that was the party that was looking to maintain Jim Crow, the yeah. system of Jim they, Crow. They, they, of they, course, they, we know what happened. The yeah. party changed mm -hmm. um, uh, over, over time. Yeah. Um, and uh, adopted different platforms, and the parties ultimately ended up reversing um, in terms of um, po political objectives or priorities with regard to racial justice. Um, but nonetheless, uh, there are many in our community that are frustrated with voting, frustrated with politicians because they have voted before or they've seen others vote, and they still see, you know, um, they don't have jobs. Unemployment yep. is still, you know, double digits in our communities. Um, they don't have um, access to systems of, of health care. They don't have access to quality systems of education. And we can go all the way down the line. They don't see much change happening. So they have become frustrated with the vote. Yeah, but I just really hands. want to, I want to underscore it uh, as difficult as it is. This is one of our tools to fight and we can't stop. We've got to, our problem has been is you vote or we vote and then we go home. And you don't hold the leaders accountable um, mm -hmm. to making sure that they enact your priorities and your agenda. And so they end up doing the agenda or doing the bidding of someone else. And so uh, your, your vote, you have to be in it for the long haul. You've got to um, you gotta vote and you've got to follow up and you've got to make sure to keep that same energy, keep that same passion, keep that same fire um, under the representatives that you send, you know, to your city council, that you send to your state legislatures, that you send um, to, to the U.S. Congress and, and beyond. And I think that if we can keep that sustained organization, because watch this, when we organize, when we get together, we win. Mm -hmm. That is the history of our people in this country. Whenever we are able to organize and collectivize and come together, we win. We are able to more effectively push our priorities. But when we kind of individualize and say, forget it, and we don't work together, um, change does not come to our community. We end up um, suffering under the same conditions. Hmm. Well said, well said. Uh, all right, so the next thing I have, just we got a few minutes. Just want to talk about is Black History Month. You know, uh, we talked about the voter suppression. We talked about January, January 6th. So you are a professor there of sociology at Howard University. What do you think uh, should be taught to our kids, you know, during Black, Black, or just taught, period, during Black History Month? Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I think it is important when we talk about Black history and what should be taught. Um, we want to be clear that our children, that our young people, that even we are exposing ourselves to our history and having a clear understanding of what that is. Um, sociologists, we teach that um, uh, society is made up of, of four primary structures, economic, political, social, and ideological. Um, the ideological structures are where we get the ideas. Um, that, that govern society, the ideas that support why we do the things that we do. Um, so much in the dominant ideology, the ideology that's prevailed is filled with, or, or it represents the perspective um, of another group and uh, does not represent the perspective of people of color. Um, and it is the dominant ideology. We have got to move away from embracing um, someone else's lens and framework and perspective for seeing the world and we've got to learn to see the world for ourselves the importance importance of black history is making sure that we go back and we we get the facts we do the history um, a lot of what was not taught um, in traditional schools a lot of what is not a part of um, curricula uh, when it comes to the racial history of this country there's a reason that that's not there because it's not in the interest of those who are teaching it and the, the not in the interest of the society that prefers one group's power over another. Um, we've got to go back and make sure that we are understanding our history and then we are learning to look at the world from our own perspective. That means that we've got to deconstruct the ideas and the frameworks that have been given to us. We've got to challenge the ideas. We've got to challenge the, um, uh, the ideas of, of meritocracy, the ideas of, of even democracy. Um, which, which seems to be kind of a... a wait, 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 you're saying a lot. So a meritocracy, break that down for those yeah. who don't know what's the meritocracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, preacher. Yeah, uh, meritocracy, just uh, it's the whole idea of, you know, you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Uh, that, that's kind of the Americana, the American way is uh, nobody gave me any handouts. I got to work and I got mine. Um, and the way that I got mine was equally and fairly. And if you work 
um, as hard you can get um, you can get what what anyone else can get and you can accomplish your dreams. Um, it sounds good. It, it's something that uh, many in this country have wanted to believe and many have tried to believe and has worked out for for some. Um, but again, when we talk about racial hierarchy, there are barriers um, that some communities that some groups experience that others do not experience. You've got uh, many people of color who work hard, who have been working hard, who are working uh, overtime and um, and two shifts uh, and beyond, and still uh, they still don't have a living wage. Um, they still can't feed their family. They still can't take care of their basic expenses. They're working hard. They're going to school, doing what they're supposed to do. But because they don't have resources, they have to borrow and take out student loans. Um, there are all kinds of weights and barriers that are disproportionately spread um, on some groups and not on others. And to pretend that that is not um, that does not exist, that just goes against the facts. That just goes against the facts of um, um, all of the various measures, social measures or indicators of social inequality um, from income to, to household wealth to uh, employment to health care, to education. Mm -hmm. All of these are organized in our country across racial lines. Um, and now either that's a coincidence or that's the way that the system was designed to, to set things up. Um, so again, when we talk about meritocracy, it's a mythology. When we even talk about democracy, we just talked um, about you know Jim Crow. Um, mm -hmm. has the, you cannot call yourself a democracy if large, large groups of, of your population don't have the right to vote. Um, mm -hmm. And when was the right to vote given to black folk? That was 1965. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a result of that, um, you you might be able to say, <laughs> you know, that for the last, what, uh, 50 some odd years, perhaps, um, it, this has resembled more of a democracy. But nonetheless, we still have these, uh, these recent examples of uh, voter suppression and Jim Crow 2.0. So, so, so wait, wait, I just want to, I mean, to cut you off. So mm -hmm. what should be taught in our schools, you're saying it needs to be taught not from a Eurocentric lens, you know, but but more for, um, from what you would say, not an Afrocentric, but... Yeah, I, I think um, every, um, uh, all different groups need to be represented in the classroom. And when you right. don't see yourself in your learning, um, that is incredibly disempowering. Um, I, I did a dissertation on that. When children are able to see themselves in their learning, in their education, and in their educator, um, their teachers, um, they're able to see teachers of color, they're able to identify and relate to them. And then when the learning is, is made relevant to them, um, that's something that I even do um, with, with my students in, in my courses. I make sure whatever we're talking about, their Kymian theory, which, you know, is a European social theorist. I've got to figure out a way to make it plain and relevant to mm -hmm. urban black folk, um, to urban black students. Not that they are unintelligent, but they've got to be able to make the connections to understand how does this impact my world? And mm -hmm. so I, I, we have to teach our kids to look and to learn from their own perspective. And we got to understand what that perspective is. Look, see the world through your own eyes and through your own lens, through your own framework. Can you give us an example of that? Yeah. So, of course, there's this um, the, this huge debate right now. We went through this whole racial reckoning right back um, in the summer of 2020. And and supposedly America woke up. Um, they woke up and they understood. Oh, wait a second. We've had this thing called racism and there there's uh, inequality and there's uh, police brutality. Um, and as a result of that, you saw some symbolic changes um, taking place. You know, um, you can't buy an Aunt Jemima brand syrup anymore. Um, mm -hmm. It's now Pearl Milling's company. Um, you saw some symbolic changes and you saw also some substantive policy changes, but you still didn't have the, um, we have not seen major legislation passed uh, to um, make a difference or to, to, to stop or change police brutality. We haven't seen major legislation to um, change um, and, and protect the, the right to vote for um, certain attack communities. Um, so as a result, <clears throat> as a result of what we, uh, of this racial reckoning and what came um, from the, the changes that came in the, the, the changes that came in the racial reckoning, um, mm -hmm. I, I just lost my train of thought. Preacher, say the question again. <laughs> uh, you you was talking you saw about, the, in the, about racial racial reckoning, talking about you know the kids, um, just this just the school system. What 
or what what should be taught in the schools you're saying kids seeing themselves okay there, there it was there it was mm -hmm. i was thinking about the critical race theory as the mm -hmm. reaction against um the the racial reckoning and mm -hmm. so there there was this push everyone is feeling like okay we've got to uh have racial equality all of that we we saw that for several months things mm -hmm. kind of died down and then you had this pushback now on the other side where now it was uh wait a second we can't teach these things if we teach um, the history of slavery, if we teach the history of colonization, if we teach um, all of these things in um, the school books, then folk are going to see that some of the myths are not true, uh, that this has not been one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. It has not been a country of equality for all people and all groups. Um, and as a result of that, that will mean that things have to change. And so we have seen over this last year, this hard push back against um, critical race theory, which is a um, theory originating in the discipline of law um, mm -hmm. that looks to uh, analyze race in the in the um, in the construction and the establishment of the country, um, and and as a result of that that honest analysis, that honest looking at history and the the ugly racial history of this country, mm -hmm. there have been many that have not wanted to to see that and acknowledge that, and so the push has now been and laws have now been passed, has been legislated that you can't teach. Um, certain things you can't teach about race, you can't teach about slavery in a certain way, you can't teach anything that will make yeah. some students feel uncomfortable. All, all of those things are, are have been a part of that pushback. Yeah, yeah, and also you know, um, just just in thinking about it, you know, uh, you know, as a therapist, I always say if it's revealed, it can't be healed. Mm -hmm. So you know, you talk about those things, bring those things up, you know, then that's when healing takes place. But the more you're trying to suppress it and get away from the truth. You know, that's 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 not going to help. We know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. All truth is liberating. Mm -hmm. you know, so you anytime you want to skirt around it, it's not going to help. Yeah. You know? As I tell my students, anytime that you um, tell that real history and get kind of the real facts, uh, the, the ugly underbelly of, of this country, um, if you acknowledge that and if you accept that um, it was wrong, um, and that there are results, right? There are legacies that have come from slavery. There are legacies that have come from Jim Crow. There are legacies that have come from um, urban poverty and all these things. If mm -hmm. you understand that and you accept that and you acknowledge that, then that means that you have to do something about it. And that means that society has to change. And if society changes, that means I've, I've got to change it to make it fairer and more equal for all groups. And that it's, goes against- The institutions have to change. The institutions have to change. The structures have to change. Mm -hmm. The ideas have to change. The entire, yeah. Essentially, the entire social structure has to Both change. Gotta change. And, and we, we, we can't do that. This is the house that we built. Um, <laughs> Uh, racial hierarchy, um, racism is, is a part of the house that America built. And we have seen time after time that there may be these waves, political waves that, right. you know, push back and allow some change to happen. But ultimately, um, we when, once that fire kind of uh, uh, burn, burns out a little bit or is not as hot, we see things kind of going back to that status quo of, of ensuring certain ideas, ensuring a certain, um, a certain structure of privilege for some and disadvantage for others. Right, right. Now, now I want to ask you another question, but I'm, I'm gonna save that. I'm gonna save that because we, we'll, we'll just. This is how we talk on the phone. I, I'll just, I'll just keep asking you more and more questions, but we'll, yeah. we'll actually want to save that. But yeah. I, I do want to plant this seed for the next time. When mm -hmm. you preach about this stuff, right? What has been your reception um, in trying to raise the level of consciousness? Yeah. Uh, what what has been is is it this welcome arms your, your message? yeah 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 preach uh, no, no, don't don't say too much don't yeah. say oh, too okay. much I'll leave it that that's the yeah. question for next time yeah yeah we'll we'll, okay. we'll answer that next time we'll answer that next time okay. and so I and I just want to say for everyone that's watching you know this sort of podcast you know you could you could listen any any part anywhere you could pick up a podcast color conversations is there um. Uh, right now, we're on my YouTube, the Kenan Tyler YouTube or, or Facebook. Eventually, we're going to upload it to a few other platforms. But we want you to just continue to join us. We're going to try to do this every other week. You know, we want to start it in Black History Month. Um, but, however, I do want to say that that Dr. Pastor Kenlock, he will be joining us. He will be, you know, my co-host. So we'll be doing this together. You know, we'll be doing this together. So we're going to have a lot of fun. 
And uh, and uh, I'm excited. We're not just always going to talk about the same thing. We're going we're gonna, we're gonna to talk about other stuff. We may throw in sports and just what's going on in society. We may throw in some other stuff to try to try to keep him on his toes. Go uh, preacher, you just dropped that on me. I'm going to co-host with you now. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're going to co-host with me. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, come on. Clap it up. Yeah, we, we we talked about it. I love yeah. you, man. You know you're my yeah. brother from another mother, and I'm just glad to be able to chop it up with you. Let's talk sports. Let's talk about your Knicks. Let's talk about my Lakers see, and, see, and, see. and what, whatever else is out there. Yeah, see, now uh, he's well, from, Let's not talk about my Lakers right now. Not, yeah, he's from L.A. A good place. I'm from New York, so it's going to be real interesting. You know, mm -hmm. you know. Anybody got love for Snoop Dogg? Whatever, whatever Snoop Dogg say. But West Side is the best side, my yeah, brother. Yeah, yeah, Remember yeah. that. All right, see, we, are, we, we we come on now. You just announced your toes. We don't want to take that away now. Nah. <laughs> let's play. Right. <laughs> but let, let's let's go ahead. We're gonna we're gonna pray. We're gonna pray this thing out. And um, thank you again for joining. Uh, for those that's watching, and also uh, thank you, Doctor Kenlock, for for joining me today. And thank you for accepting being the host, man. We're gonna have some fun. Have yes. some fun. But can you pray us out? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Father in heaven, we just pray right now, dear God, we need you. Um, we've talked about some very serious issues and things that are happening in this world and in this country, uh, dear God, but we recognize that you are um, the you are the king of kings, that you are um, the, the great potentate and the greatest power above all powers, dear God, and that you are coming up to set up an everlasting kingdom. But yet and still, you call us to take a stand on the principles of justice and righteousness to make a difference in this world. You said the kingdom of God has come to you right now. So, Father, may we um, do our part as um, men and women under the cross to stand up for um, Christian biblical values, to stand up for humanity, um, to emphasize the, the power of love, um, to push back against the systems and the principles of hate um, that we have seen dominate and oppress so many for so long. Uh, bless all of those who have watched today, and we pray, God, that um, you might continue to keep them hopeful, um, keep them encouraged, and keep them faithful, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Make sure y'all like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Spread the word. All right. God bless everyone. Remember, no matter what, trust God. All right.